as you meditate, you start noticing the power of your perceptions, the labels you have that you apply to things, the way you visualize things. Really has a huge influence over what you what you see. You can see this clearly with the breath. We have certain preconceived notions of how the breath comes into the body, what we have to do in order to bring it into the body, how the process of breathing relates to the different parts of the body, and then we breathe in line with that. And many times it's a caricature of what's actually going on. So we have to learn to look at the process in other ways. Consciously change the way you conceive your breathing, see what happens. At the very least, it'll give you a good insight into the relationship between mental events and physical events. It's not always the case as mind. the mind is just reacting to things outside. Sometimes it's shaping things outside, too. It's important to see this. If we don't get a sense of how we shape things, and we never really get a chance to look into the mind. For starters, there's the concept of the breath, not as the air coming in and out of the lungs, but the energy flow in the body. Some people have a lot of problems with this, other people have no problems at all. But allow yourself to think in those ways and see what happens. And instead of thinking the, of the, the body pulling the breath in, remember that your primary experience of the body is breath, is the energy flow. Our perceptions tend to solidify that, so we all often think well, that the solid parts of the body are our primary experience of the body, and the breath is something secondary, but it's actually the other way around. So allow yourself to think in that other way around. Your body is sitting here in the breath, in the process of breathing. So that your primary experience is whatever you perceive as a primary experience, think of it as breath. If you have trouble, if the breath seems constricted or tight, remind yourself of this and you find that it opens up a lot. And then you can start thinking of other places where the breath comes in. Where does it come in the body? Where are the entry points of the breath? What kind of energy comes in goes out? What kind of energy is there already in the body and stays there? How are they related? You have to learn how to question these things, otherwise you don't see anything. The Japanese Zen master Dogen had a phrase for this. He called it de-thinking thinking. In other words, the questions you ask that take apart your assumptions. And he has a nice passage where he says, is the body sitting in the mind or is the mind sitting in the body? Is the sitting sitting in the sitting? And all kinds of questions that you normally sound kind of strange, but when you actually look at how you relate to your immediate present experience, you begin to realize that the mind has some pretty strange assumptions. Sometimes it takes pretty strange questions to notice those assumptions, take them apart. Even as you're just getting acquainted with the breath, it's good to ask these kinds of questions so you know where you're settling down. And you really look at what you're experiencing in the present moment. Most of the time there will be some sort of filter on that experience, but you can learn how to change the filters and find which filters are more useful than others which concepts are more useful than others. Part of this is using your ingenuity, part of this is using your powers of observation. And together they create a sense of interest. What really is going on here? As you get more and more absorbed in exploring these things, you find it easier and easier for the mind to settle down. 
And without even thinking about them, you've got what they call the four bases of success. There's the desire, the interest, the persistence as you keep after it, the close attention you're playing, paying to it, and then the amount of ingenuity that you put into the questions you ask. All these things contribute to concentration, help the concentration get settled, get solid, get it very clear. It's this ability to ask questions that makes all the difference in your practice. As you work with the breath in, the way, in this way, the questions start building up to the Four Noble Truths. Okay, where exactly is the stress? What's causing it? You start finding that you see more, more and more subtle levels of stress. Simply by raising that question. If you don't raise questions, you just sit here in, out, in, out, in, out. It becomes very mechanical. And after a while you wonder what you're doing, because you're not doing anything. Sometimes the questions are aimed at getting the mind to settle down. If the mind isn't settling down, ask yourself, what's going on? How is the way I relate to the breath a problem? Because the breath itself normally is not a problem. It's your relationship to it that's the problem. Your preconceived notions about it, the way you force yourself to breathe in this way, breathe in that way. Your preconceived notions of what it means to be concentrated, how much tension you have to create in order to keep the mind present. You have to catch yourself doing these things. To see where there's unnecessary tension, unnecessary stress. Which is making the process of meditation uncomfortable, disagreeable. And then learn to relax it. Sometimes it means changing the point of your focus. Sometimes it means changing the quality of your focus. Sometimes it means changing your concept of what it means to be focused. Who's focusing? Here's the mind in one spot and then trying to focus the mind in one spot on another spot. Well, what does that do? Can you think of the awareness that's already there? at the spot that you're hoping to focus on. When you ask questions like this, you find that the mind begins to settle down. As you find ways of making the experience of the pleasant, present moment a lot more pleasant, a lot easier to deal with. Then once the mind is settled down, Give it some time to stay there. The next question is, how can you keep it there? Which parts of the process were necessary to focus in? And then once it focuses in, okay, which parts can you let go? Which parts do you have to hold on to in order to maintain that focus? Creating the focus and maintaining are two separate processes. And again, it's uh, learning how to ask those questions so you notice things. And when you learn how to maintain it, okay, can you maintain it in all situations? This level of steadiness, this level of being centered. What gets in the way? When you start seeing the things that get in the way, that's the beginning of what might more directly be called insight. And the same holds when you've been sitting very quietly for a long period of time, maintaining that focus, maintaining that focus, until it seems more and more second nature. And the question is, well, can you still detect some subtlety in that focus? Still detect some subtle stress in there? And what goes along with the stress? what vagrant movements in the mind are creating it, or what persistent movements in the mind are creating it. You have to watch for both. This way you can give rise to the insight in the process of doing concentration. The Buddha never separated concentration practice from insight practice. All the time he said you develop tranquility and insight 
in order to attain concentration. Then once the concentration is there, okay, you use the concentration to develop further tranquility and further insight. The two are all part of the same process. But it comes down to learning how to ask the right questions about the present moment and learning to ask which questions should be asked at which time. So when the mind needs a place to settle down, you're not asking all sorts of insight questions. You're asking the more the questions, okay, what can I do to keep this going, keep this going, keep this going? Or if I can't even get there yet, what can I do to get there? So learning how to ask questions is an important skill in the practice, as it is in any skill. You have to be observant. You have to notice things, and a lot of times that means framing questions in the mind. The questions deal with issues of the Four Noble Truths. How can we get the path together? How can we maintain the path, to make it more subtle, make it stronger? How we can use that, those factors of the path, the qualities you're developing in your mind, the clarity of awareness, the steadiness of awareness. How can that be used to understand the questions of suffering and stress? These are good questions. But even with good questions, you have to have a sense of time and place. And it's important to keep your questions to what's absolutely necessary. I once received a letter from a monk who had 600 Dharma questions he wanted me to answer. My feeling was, if you have that many questions, none of them are really life and death questions. Someone writes a letter with one question, okay, I believe them. So as you're sitting, you're trying to sort out which are the most important questions for helping the mind right now. And everything else you can let go, put aside. The Buddha chose to answer only those questions that he said would lead to awakening, lead to disenchantment, lead to clear seeing and knowing, right here in the present moment. An important part of the practice is just learning which questions qualify, and learning how to focus your attention on those, because those are the ones that really give results.